D. Watkins here with Salon TV, and today I'm joined by my great friend, Professor Wendy Osifo. Um, she's a professor at Johns Hopkins University and a Democratic political analyst. And today we're here to break down the big wins for Democrats in the House and, and Senate. And, well, it wasn't really any big wins in the Senate. <laughs> what? And what does Tuesday results mean? It'll tell us about America's deep divisions mm -hmm. and what should we be looking forward to in 2020? Uh, we have to look forward to everything in 2020 because <laughs> everything is on the line. But even for all of those people who had the wins taken out of their sales, I want us to remember a few things. One, we were able to basically flip 290 state legislators. Mm. We flipped seven governorships. We flipped three state Supreme Court seats and then three ruby red states. And this is really important. They expanded Medicaid. Why all of this matters is we had wins, not to mention that we also got to take over the House of Representatives. So Democrats should be energized, but there's still areas that we need to focus on, and that should be our laser focus going into 2020. Yeah, because there was so much focus on Beto and oh Gilliam gosh. and Stacey Abrams, yes. which is still going on right now. Right, you know, right. Please stay in the fight. Yes. And I think a Do lot not of, concede. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people, a lot of people are discouraged, and I don't think the fact that Dems took the House isn't, you know, I don't think it's getting enough play. It's not getting enough play because I think what the Democratic Party has a tendency to do is to add the notion of celebrity behind each election that they mm. focus on. Mm -hmm. So we know about, even though we don't live in Florida, we know about Gillum. Even though we don't live in, in Georgia, we know about Abrams. Even though we don't live in Texas, we know about Beto O'Rourke. But there are other wins besides People those. People riding around New York with Beto but, Exactly. <laughs> and it's good to energize your base. But what I want us to remember is because of those three races, it energized the entire Democratic base. And that's what we're looking to do. But we have to start pulling away. When I say we, Democrats have to start pulling away from this whole notion of celebrities being the focus of an election and realize that people want actual change. They want tangible things that they can say, this is what Democrats are going to do. And when you focus on that celebrity mm -hmm. element and it doesn't really come through, doesn't you do nothing through. but give the celebrity president exactly. fuel Fuel. You give them fuel. <laughs> to talk about it as rallies. You, you give it fuel to talk about it as rallies, and then you give them fuel to attack Obama's legacy. Because Obama came out so hard for Abrams, because Obama came out so hard for Gillum, it's now, oh, another loss for Obama. So we cannot have people necessarily in the forefront pushing their celebrityism um, for candidates. We need to have and educate the people who are actually going to cast the vote. Mm -hmm. That's what matters. So Dems took the House. What do you yes. think? What is the first thing they need to do? Uh, they need to legislate. I know that everyone wants them to start impeachment proceedings, but that's what they expect us to do. We have to be strategic. You have to have points on the board going into 2020. You cannot simply say that our big rallying cry, our big platform is the opposition of Donald Trump. Yes, you can resist, you can oppose Donald Trump, but what are you putting forth to help the American people? So they need to have easy wins. They need to look at infrastructure. They need to look at health care. 57% uh, of voters came out of the election booth yesterday saying the number one issue for me is health care. How great would that be if Democrats carried that on their back and pushed that forward to say, we, we heard you and this is what we did for health care so they need to do that and then in their spare time impeach the president <laughs> and, but, you know impeaching the president that gets all the headlines yeah that's what, that's what everyone wants to talk but they about shouldn't. we should focus on some we, strategy 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 and speaking of strategy let me talk about this white women i am speaking directly to you 59 percent of white women voted for ted cruz Let's juxtapose that to 53% of white women who voted for Donald Trump. And 21% of white women voted for Stacey Abrams compared to 22% of white men. So more white men voted for Stacey Abrams than white women. Who is the face of feminism here? If you are not going to be an ally in the struggle, you need to say that because what you're doing is your vote is lending to white patriarchy. And we need to understand as black women, we carry this all the time, but if we're gonna do this by ourselves, we need to make that very clear that we're doing it by ourselves. So would it be fair to say that every white woman isn't a feminist? And is voting supporting for certain people, is it, is it a feminist vote? Is it a feminist stance? White, every white woman is not a feminist. And every white woman doesn't necessarily have to be a feminist because it's your choice. But I find it ironic that when it comes to issues that 
are something that's carried by white women, you often see black women there standing side by side carrying this with them. But when it comes to someone like the President of the United States who uses language that can be seen as, no, not that can be seen, that is racist, that is mm -hmm. misogynist, you do not see that same level of allyship from white women to black women. What is, what is Trump, what is Ted Cruz saying that is, is getting, that is, 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 is talking them into giving them their support? Like, what is Ted Cruz saying that's getting white women excited? Or what is Donald Trump doing that gets white women excited about going to the polls and supporting him? Is it, are they following their families? Um, is it their own? Um, or maybe they're not following their families because well, more white mm -hmm. men voted for Stacey Abrams. Mm -hmm. But like, what are we missing? Or what is it in their messaging that makes them feel like they should support? Every day when you walk into work, you mm -hmm. walk into your home, or even the election booth, you decide which part of your identity you lead with. For some people, it is their race. For some people, it is their gender. Based on the demographics alone, it is clear that when white women walk into the election booth, they lead with their race. Because if they led with their gender, they would not vote for someone like Donald Trump who says, grab them by the... They would not vote for a man who says, you're bleeding out of the you-know-where. They are clearly voting based on their race and not their gender. But we got to see that, like, the race, you know, the divisiveness and the race-baiting stuff isn't, isn't really working. It's not working. But why are people still subscribing to it? Because are they trying to hold on to something that they feel like they're missing? Or You know what? And, and, I, and I will actually add another piece to that, that comment you just made. I think for Democrats, we need to wake up and realize that after this election, it is clear that people do not care what Donald Trump says. They care about his actions. The hope going into this election was that individuals will say, oh my gosh, I'm offended by Charlottesville. Oh my gosh, I'm offended by you know, what happened with you know, neo-Nazis. But they're not. They're looking at his actions. So we cannot have these oh my God moments when Donald Trump does something because it clearly does not move the needle when it comes to elections. Yeah, I think we're already at a point now where we expect him exactly. to say, exactly. to say exactly. anything. So one thing that I was inspired by was there were so many young people mm. um, who I didn't really see talking mm -hmm. about the election of mm -hmm. 2016, mm -hmm. excited about these mm -hmm. midterms. Um, they felt like they stay home and they shouldn't have stayed home because they see the, the direction Constance. our country is headed yeah. in. So, you know, they were tweeting, they were Instagramming, they were out in the streets, they were, you know, supporting politicians, wearing mm -hmm. t-shirts mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. out waving campaign signs, and mm -hmm. it was a good thing. And then the celebrities who we put, you know, who the Democratic Party put a lot of faith in didn't really win. So. Um, what would you tell them young people who feel let down by the process? Don't be let down. It's, it's, it's not a destination, it's a journey. We have to undo what was done in 2016 and even years before that. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time, it's gonna take organizing, it's gonna take educating, it's gonna get getting people out to the polls. Uh, Amendment 4 was passed in Florida, which will give um, up to half a million, if not more, a million people, the ability to vote. And these are individuals who could not vote before. But people are chairing that amendment for happen. But how are you going to energize and galvanize the individuals who can now vote? The same thing with millennials. You cannot be, um, you know, shell-shocked, so to speak, from this election, but you can just be energized. And if I can add this, you and I are old enough to remember the whole vote or die campaign with P. Diddy. And I believe at that time, um, who was running? John Kerry was running. And it was P. Diddy, yeah. vote or die. He lost. But that did so not... Did good, that would be a good ticket, P. Diddy and John You're Kerry. so funny. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he lost, right? But that did not stop our generation because we are the same people who, although we voted for Kerry and he lost, we then went ahead and voted for Obama, yeah. right? So you cannot say, oh, because it didn't go my way, this midterms, I'm done. No, you keep on going because it's a journey. So what happened in the Senate? I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know I'm not but, supposed but you to would, say that. I would, I would argue, I would argue that, um, you know, win or loss, I think, I think Beto, you know, transformed politics in Texas. Like, I think a lot of progressive people um, are going to be inspired by his run, and, you know, they're going to start to change the way they try to engage and move forward. Absolutely. I think, I think uh, Beto is one of those energizing forces. I don't think this is the last of him. I think this is the beginning of him. We're going to see him in future elections. Um, and I do think he energized the base because even though Beto lost, it was never supposed to be that close. 
Texas is a ruby red state. He should not have had any chance of winning, so to speak, but he was so close. There were even times when the polls were coming in that he was leading. That is some, there's something to be said there. There's an energy that's, you know, that, that you can touch that's happening, and we need to carry that. So you wanted a few black people on Fox News. <laughs> that we, I mean, we we're, we're always cheering for you because you have you have to go toe to toe with um, some of the you know most. I'm just gonna say interesting, <laughs> interesting <laughs> brain dead type of people all of the Aww. time. And what I would what I want to say to you, and this is kind of the you know in preparation for the for the battles you're about to have, mm. you know, what are you gonna say to the Trump people who come on the show mm. and claim victory? You can't claim victory because at the end of the day, we flipped the House of Representatives. Before going into this, it was a Republican-held Congress. It was a Republican-held executive. But now we can say the Democrats hold the House of Representatives. And for people who are not energized by that, what that does is it puts a check and balance on the presidency. Before the president can do whatever he wanted because Republicans held both sides. Now he cannot do that. And we have individuals who are going to go into positions of power who will directly oversee whether or not they request his tax his mm -hmm. tax returns, individuals who can, you know, start impeachment proceedings, individuals who are going to oversee the Russian investigation. So no, we did not lose. We flipped we flipped places we were not supposed to flip and we may engage in places we were not supposed to. So this is a great start. And where should we go for twenty twenty? Like what's so so now, you know, you don't you don't wait to the end of two thousand nineteen and start planning. Starts you, today. You, it starts today. That's so right. what's the next move? The next move is we need to find a platform that we are running on. What are the Democrats going to deliver to show to the country, this is what we can do for you? Furthermore, who is going to be that voice, that leader who is going to take us over the hill? Third of all, pull away from the celebrities. It has not necessarily garnered us wins. We need a candidate that's going to energize us. These celebrities don't energize us for the long term. They energize us only for that short period, but we need something tangible. And until we get that, we are not going to see gains. Okay, so throw out some dream tickets. Who do you want to see on that 2020 ticket? Beto. <laughs> After yesterday, I wouldn't have said this, but I think Beto. Um, I, you know what I say? I feel like... But I need, I need president, I know, president I know, and I know, vice president. I know, I know, I know. Okay, um, Biden and, and Harris. Okay, Biden and Harris. I know Biden is old, but I think Biden will go blow for blow when it comes to Trump. He'll get in his face. Um, I think Beto and anyone would be great. I think he, he, he has a fire. He energizes people. He speaks to the masses. He's really, really good. Um, those are my top three mm -hmm. right now. Beto and Gilliam? <laughs> Beto and Gilliam would be good, but I think that what we have to also understand, because of all the legislators that were flipped, this has been now touted as the year of the woman. 19 women came in. History. The first black woman to represent Massachusetts came in. The first black woman to represent Connecticut came in. The first black, the first Somali American came in. The first Muslim American. So, so many women made history last night that we would do ourselves a disservice if a woman was not on the Democratic ticket. A woman has to be there. And overall, you're claiming uh, mid-2018 midterms is a victory. It's a victory. We, it, it's a victory, but with all victories, you have lessons that you have to learn from. And I hope that the Democratic Party takes that on. And I hope you guys are listening. Tell everyone, <laughs> tell everyone where they can find you. You can find me on all social media platforms at Wendy Osefo. Thank you. Have a great day.